Good afternoon. This is the final session uh, of this afternoon. Uh, my name is Mark Callery. I'm uh, here at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Harvard Medical School. And a uh, great honor and thank you, President Jones, for the invitation to uh, participate here to moderate a panel on how surgeons are leading change. Uh, I promise you there will be no amygdala hijacks during this, but there will be a Boston accent. <laughs> now, before we get started with the panel, I wanted to frame the issue, as it were, uh, to try to help you understand about what we hope to talk about. Although the title is How Surgeons Are Leading Change, I wanted to frame the issue of what it really means to lead change and why it's important. And I became a, a student of this actually a couple of years ago at an SSA team meeting when Selwyn Vickers, our president, invited uh, James Dallas uh, to speak and to talk about his, his book that I've since read and reviewed a few times. John, I'm sure you know uh, James as well, uh, perhaps. Uh, he's a senior business executive of the United States. You can see where he has spent his career. And he gave a great talk on mastering the challenges of leading change. And when he talked about this, somebody had a pointer earlier. When he talked about this, you can see up in the top right, uh, he indicated that there's a gap between uh, the interests and the vision, uh, the strategy, and the need. Thank you, Deb. Thank you. I think I might have set you up for that. Sorry. Here we are. The vision and the need uh, and the strategy required to affect change and that that change is required to get you to your new reality. Uh, he stressed also the concept of, concept of execution. Uh, you can see here the building blocks. And ultimately, at the end of the day, if you're successful, you'll have bridged the gap, you'll have achieved the new reality, and you've done so on added benefits of trust and engagement uh, and teamwork. Now, change itself is kind of a threatening word, perhaps, but if you look at the same type of analogy, uh, yeah, you're getting to a new reality shown here by greener grass, but there's still the importance of a lot of the things that have already been established at the beginning. Uh, you do not throw away the past as you affect and try to build change. Uh, that's very, very much important to, uh, to read into this. If you read only the first few paragraphs of his book, he also teaches you that many of the reasons change is not effectively uh, achieved in organizations is because the, uh, the mistakes are made right out of the gate at this level right here. So how do you do this? Well, he talks uh, on a change leadership framework, the so-called four Ps. And I'm not going to read these out each for you, but I want you to have a look at them, have the panel uh, have a careful look at them also, because I'd like to see how these come up in our discussions. Uh, the first section is on priorities, course, expectations, teamwork. Second is on politics, uh, communicating, overcoming barriers and resistance. People, knowing how to work with people, reading the minds, the concept of reading the room, uh, navigating group dynamics. And in the end, uh, but a key part of it is perseverance, handle discontentment, and then ultimately institutionalize and leverage the change you've worked towards. We're here at Harvard, so we have to talk about a faculty member, and what better a person to talk about this than John Cotter up the river at the business school. Uh, you can see here, known internationally as the premier voice on just how the best organizations in the world have actually achieved successful transformations. And Professor Carter puts back the concept according to his eight steps of leading change, another great book. And these are shown here. It's the big opportunity can be overcome and reached, and that's called change, by first creating a sense of urgency, next building a guiding coalition, third, form, fourth, enlist a team, five, enable that team, six, generate content and product, seven, accelerate, institute, number eight, and then change comes, and you execute it, and then you start all over on the next change that you have to do. And so on the basis of this, this is framing the issue of what we want to talk about today with the panelists in terms of how surgeons can lead change uh, amongst our different realms 
And to do that, it's a great privilege to uh, welcome uh, these austere surgeons and, and colleagues. Uh, our past president, your top left, uh, and our current uh, executive director of the American Board of Surgery, Dr. Joe Beiske. Uh, up on the top right is General Dr. Jonathan Woodson uh, speaking to his past boss, uh, President Obama from the uh, Department of Defense. Uh, down in the bottom left, uh, my old partner in crime, uh, founding chief of the Division of Colorectal Surgery at Beth Israel Deaconess, Dr. Deborah Nagel. And then Don, John DeChapel, who is the Global Chief Medical Officer for Medtronic. So welcome and thank you very, very much. Uh, before I go into some specific questions, I'd give each of you the opportunity to offer any thoughts that you might have about what I've said already. Well, I guess we'll, I'll start and we'll go down the table. Um, so I think those concepts are um, uh, really valid that uh, leaders fundamentally have to establish a vision and motivate people to work toward common goals to achieve that vision. Um, one caveat is that uh, sometimes uh, uh, you need to work toward um, uh, a transformational change, and sometimes that's hard for people to accept, uh, meaning it's over the horizon, and so you've got to give people sometimes incremental goals to work toward until you get to that tipping point so that they can see uh, what really needs to be done. Otherwise, they'll think you're crazy. Uh, and then the key is really uh, communicate, communicate or articulate um, uh, clear lines of action in order to uh, achieve those goals. So I'll stop there. So I absolutely resonate with the vision and the plan and being able to communicate that for people. I absolutely believe that small incremental wins are the way to go because everyone can then get on board with something they can celebrate. One of the things that I think is missing in that wheel is the opportunity to entrain people and have them celebrate and feel good about the wins as they're occurring. And I think it's really important to um, have that happen so that people stay on board with you and continue moving the mission forward. I like everything that's been said. Um, I'm sort of struck by the general positivity of it because a lot of change has a lot of sturm and drang associated with it. So there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of anger. Um, and for me, the underlying uh, point to remember in the whole circle of change is that change brings with it fear and loss for a lot of people, that they understood a certain environment, they understood their role in it, they thought that they might have ascended to a particular position or salary or whatever lifestyle that existed within that environment and that change threatens that. And so there's a lot of fear uh, behind it, so that has to be somewhere in that circle uh, to remember to acknowledge that and to deal with it along the way before it raises its ugly head. So it's sort of unlike me because I usually have the really optimistic thing, but I want to uh, remember the, um, the pitfalls and change also. Change is, um, is tough to do, right? Um, and there's a lot of entrenched interests. So how do you start with that? I heard earlier uh, the word li being, a, kind of being a good listener as, as being critical. I would say, take it a step further, you have to be uh, someone who asks good questions and then listen carefully. And once you understand all the stakeholders and you take account of all of them, understand what their interests are, then you can start to influence and cause change in time. Okay, thank you very, very much. Uh, we're gonna go to this slide and leave it up here. This will put up uh, Cotter's Eight Steps for Leading Change uh, that's been really deployed worldwide, uh, and it's broken down into three colors, as you can see. The first three items of the circle, so to speak, are for creating a climate for change, and I think Dr. Beisky's comments just then really uh, hit on this, of making sure that there's a culture uh, that understands what's ahead of them. Uh, so I guess the first question would be is, how do surgeons go about uh, creating and understanding uh, a culture or a climate in order to get change moving? Well, um, you know, if you look at this slide, there are some things that I think are very important. Uh, um, uh, understanding uh, the sense of urgency, um, which can be translated in a number of ways that if you don't address the issues, um, are you going to be relevant to the future? Um, and uh, that's really sort of a, uh, I think, a powerful way of framing 
uh, the need to do business differently, um, uh, create uh, uh, different organizational structures to respond to the imperatives uh, that are out there. Uh, clearly, you need to build the team, but you also need to build competencies within that team, and you needed to balance the competencies within that team. Everybody can't have the same strengths or you, or you won't uh, succeed. Uh, clearly communicate, um, and I know we'll get back to that, but I want to jump uh, to the end uh, there where it says don't let up. Uh, one of the things I think um, uh, surgeons um, and all leaders need to understand uh, is that uh, leading, particularly leading transformative change, uh, requires a great deal of energy. Uh, it can be exhausting at times. Uh, and you got to know how to, in fact, uh, recharge your own battery and sustain uh, sort of the momentum for change, but also sustain those who are going to be important uh, to the team to carry out that, uh, that change. It's uh, not for the light, uh, uh, light of heart uh, to talk about uh, um, uh, doing transformative change. So. When I think about culture and climate for change, I really reflect on the fact that we in medicine have a very culturally driven practice. And I think the hugest hurdle right off the bat is getting people and getting all surgeons to recognize this so that they can move from a very culturally based, which really comes from the institution where you train, right? You listen to your senior leaders when you're training who say, yep, and I do this and I can sleep every night. And we all have high stakes performance and we all need those assurances. So you learn a specific set of patterns which may or may not be the best way to do things. And to transform all of healthcare going forward, I think we need to move from, we need to first get people to understand that that's how we've all been raised. And what we need to do is move to a more evidence-based, more process-based system that allows us to bring the best of everybody's performance together and then guide, um, guide performance going forward. So first of all, looking at this graph, I'm just uh, super relieved to see that in changing maintenance and certification, I'm right on track for that whole pathway. So. <laughs> <laughs> Way to go. <laughs> uh, I'm also interested in the number seven, don't let up. Uh, I think it's uh, changes uh, may come more naturally to surgeons when there is a burning platform, when there's an increased sense of urgency, because we, by nature, as a, uh, as a rule, deal pretty well with that. We're good at the, um, the urgent decision, the decisive action. Uh, it's harder when there isn't really a burning platform. It's more about this is for the better. This would be better if we could do it this way. Those are the ones that I find the most difficult. Those are the ones that require the don't let up. Um, um, you know, one of one of the people who taught me most about leadership told me once, never let uh, an important issue get all the way to the negative vote. Uh, so I can't tell you how many things I've sort of pulled back at the last second. I said, oh, I see we need to have more discussion on this. We'll call that vote. Uh, and some of those some of those things have stuck around literally for years. Uh, but I think it's okay to take your time and wait and sort of bring people around over time if there isn't a burning platform. The burning platform things are one thing. They take courage. Um, they take inventiveness. They take being out front. But I think surgeons can fall in line with that a little bit better than the things that feel less urgent. So those are the ones that take the real don't let up persistence. Along those lines, I might highlight number five as it jumps out at me. Uh, maybe just to share a story. We had a problem in my division with engagement. Uh, our engagement scores were once pretty high and they, they had come down pretty precipitously. And so how do you get change? How do we get our folks more engaged than ever? So I start off by asking those folks on my leadership team, those who report directly to me, hey, what's going on? What are the drivers of disengagement? What can we do? And they came back not with very much. So then what we did was we went to the most junior people in the organization and asked them, what are the problems, what are the issues, and what solutions do you have? And they took ownership of those solutions, and they became the leads for all the subgroups to work on each one of those solutions, and that caused change, and boom, our scores went right back up again. Okay, well, you just got yourself in trouble there, John, because I'm going to have you answer another question. <laughs> uh, but as Paresh did last session, certainly anybody, please get right up to the microphone and interrupt us so we can participate as a group. So going back to you on your example right there, uh, and I think all of you touched on this, let's, let's go back and look at number two and number three. <clears throat> what's, what are, what's your advice for, for building the, the guiding team? 
And as you reach your vision, how do, you, how do you know, how do you get the feedback to know that the vision that you have for this change is even right to begin with? Well, it, <laughs> it comes down to hiring to, or forming your team, right? Um, and uh, one thing I'll say is hiring doctors, which is what I do um, amongst others, is really tough to do because um, you want to hire people with the right mindset. And that's why I think this leadership development program is so valuable. Um, because you're talking this afternoon about things that before I went into industry 10 years ago would have been totally foreign to me, but now are absolutely the language that we speak every day. Um, the people that we look for, for example, to hire, the, the people you want on your team to influence change in a large organization, in my case like Medtronic, are folks that are team players, that are inquisitive, as I alluded to uh, before, and that are humble. Going to industry is one of those humbling things. Um, and, but if you can find those folks and those qualities, then you can really uh, do some really dynamic things. So that's just, that's been my experience. Deb, you mentioned to me earlier that uh, with your transition into industry, how in building a team and et cetera, feedback is, is different in the two realms. Do you want to say anything about that? So that's one of the things that's been really um, notable for me over the course of this past year. In academic medicine, we have very little feedback aside from that which you get from your patients, right? When they say, thank you so much, you saved my life, you did such a great job. That's the kind of feedback that we're used to. In industry, you get feedback about your performance all the time. It's remarkable. And it depersonalizes and de-emotionalizes the feedback so that you can actually step back and really incorporate it and then potentially think about how else you could do things differently. So I really think that um, more routine feedback in a, in a structured way is super helpful and something that could, again, help us with the transformation from just a cultural practice in medicine to a more process quality oriented practice. Do you think that style of feedback is necessary to building the team? So I think it's really helpful because it allows people to, A, especially if you're a surgeon, going from being the leader of the team, right? I mean, basically, we're all leading a team of some kind, to um, being aware of the fact that you have to interface with people in other teams on a more lateral, um, more matrix-like method than the top-down method that we typically have in surgery. Joe and John, you, you both mentioned things that have heavy-duty, well, you didn't mention it yet, but heavy-duty national impact. We talked about uh, maintenance of certification and the changes forthcoming with that. I'm sure in healthcare policy in the United States government, a lot of these things came up. How did you know you were getting the vision right? So, so I think uh, when you approach the vision question, it requires uh, uh, some deep analysis about the imperatives for change uh, and what the future state um, uh, looks like. Um, and part of that analysis is looking at uh, what would happen, and it gets back to this issue I mentioned before about relevance if you do nothing. Um, are you going to become obsolete? And so um, getting the right vision um, is uh, about uh, sort of that uh, broader an, uh, an analysis that goes on. And this gets now to the team because you can't get, um, you can't have a, a good team that uh, can storm and norm and uh, create uh, good ideas and a strategy if everybody thinks alike. And one of the things that we've got to get comfortable with, certainly um, as surgeons and physicians and in, uh, in healthcare, is bringing in people who are totally outside of what we do. Uh, and uh, they add a tremendous amount of value in looking at uh, our business and our traditions in a different way. One of the things that happens uh, if you don't develop a diver diverse team is you get constrained by your history. Um, you get stuck in a historical context uh, uh, of your own sort of relevance and way of doing things and you really don't get the vision right. So uh, they're really in some ways two sides of the same coin. In order to get the right vision, you've got to have a diverse complementary team that can an, an analyze the imperatives for change um, and the risks for not changing. 
Dr. Baisky. So getting the vision right, I mean, I guess that remains to be seen for me. Um, you all will have to tell me that next year. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I talked about the difference between a burning platform and something patient. And I've been working at the board since 2009. And in that interview where I was not really empowered, I was not taking a position where I was empowered to make change, they said, what do you think is the most important work of the board? And I said, I think it's going to be to make MOC relevant. So I've had eight years to think about it and work about it sort of behind the scenes without actually having primary responsibility for doing it. So it was a long and patient pathway. Um, we've had the opportunity to watch other groups take stabs at it, uh, try fail, try succeed. So we got a chance to sort of sit back and go, <laughs> that didn't work, good to know. Um, and, uh, uh, and then I got to the really great tipping point of there was a burning platform, uh, which was a lot of threat on the legislative level and from right. other physicians um, to eliminate maintenance of certification altogether. So it was almost the perfect combination. Um, in terms of developing a vision, there was a lot of listening to what, uh, what uh, people who do not work primarily with the board had to say, we pay attention to blogs, we send out surveys, we ask people a lot of questions. And the team, which is really my favorite part, building the team, I think, is around getting people who are really enthusiastic about the need for change. So you start with the really enthusiastic people um, and then kind of look around the room and say, now what are the skills? Um, so uh, I think that that's the direction rather than figure out the skills and recruit people. I like to start with the enthusiastic people and say, okay, what skills are we missing now and bring in additional people. So we have a lot of non-physicians working on it. So they have the sort of voice of the public and the practical um, question saying, does this really make sense to us? Is what you're doing going to actually protect us? Um, and then the other aspect of building an internal team is, uh, is people who are quite different, um, from, I'll say from me, um, as opposed to from you, so that uh, very... Um, very practical. One of my great team leaders told me that she has a reputation for being Debbie Downer because she likes to look at every negative aspect, everything that could possibly go wrong. And it's really good that she told me that because sometimes I'm like, why? why are you so negative? But it's a very, very useful aspect to have on the team because I do tend to be like, this is great. Let's just run this forward. So different aspects of people, starting with the core group of people who are really enthusiastic, building out the skill set that you need to move it forward uh, and being sure to include people who are different uh, than you are, I think is make it happen. Well, why don't we use the prompt of uh, Debbie Downer uh, to move into the next series of green here. Uh, because I think James Dallas would say this is overcoming uh, the barriers, being able to read the room and know the people skills involved here. And this comes into engaging and enabling an entire organization. Uh, so drill down on uh, communication for buy-in. Uh, are convincing, what is the difference? Uh, empowering action, uh, creating short-term wins, and knowing when you've had one. Who wants to take that one? Well, I'll make a, a couple of comments. So uh, one of the key attributes of good leaders is the ability to influence others. And we sit, talked about this a little bit before. We, we, we mentioned the word motivate people to work toward common goals. When I was in government, uh, I was lucky enough to have uh, 535 members of Congress to deal with uh, uh, what, what, and try what, to. What, what, what were you drinking back then, John? I'm sorry? What were you drinking back then? You were fortunate. Uh, a lot. No. Uh, no, so, so, so the issue is you had to figure out how to influence them, how to influence people at the White House, how to influence people in the senior levels of the Department of Defense. And, and one of the strategies we came up with, uh, I came up with my staff, is it was a simple graphic, uh, basically, that looked like a target um, to try and figure out where the person was um, uh, in terms of their understanding or perspective on the problem so that we could craft arguments that would resonate with them. So the key in, in this business of communicating is you can't start where you want to be. You've got to seek to understand before being understood. And so the graphic was sort of uh, science and evidence in the middle, art of practice in the next ring, economics, uh, policy and politics, uh, um, and then there was this big red ring emotion. And a lot of people were operating on the basis of emotion, no fact, no fact at all. But it helped us when I was going in to see Senator so-and-so, or Congressman so-and-so, or Secretary so-and-so, or staffer at the White House so-and-so, uh, to try and understand where they were coming from so that uh, you could uh, communicate effectively about um, why your strategy was correct um, 
And sometimes you had to communicate in only economic terms. You know, budget crisis, okay, this is how we're going to save you millions of dollars. Sometimes you had to communicate in terms of quality issues. Uh, sometimes you had to ish, uh, communicate in terms of uh, the issue of uh, moral obligation uh, to servicemen and women uh, to create that change. But communicating uh, and influencing people is extraordinarily important, and, but you've got to understand where they're coming from before you can craft those relevant uh, arguments. And, and I would just extend that by saying that absolute, uh, absolutely you have to understand where people are starting so that you can bring them into the conversation because we all walk into a meeting or a discussion with a particular focus. And as surgeons, we also are working on really pressured timelines, right? So we don't actually give the time to go through a process to necessarily understand where other people are coming from. But uh, what I've learned in, the, in my time in industry is that giving that space and giving that time so that you do understand where they are and then they can voice their position so that you, everyone can understand it means that we all ultimately probably get to the same place that I wanted us to be in when we started out, but everybody's on board now. And it's not just me telling them or it's you creating the vision. The whole team has moved to um, oneness around the vision and we'll move it forward. So, you know, we heard from people from the Brandeis Leadership Programs and from the Harvard Leadership Programs, and uh, it's probably time for me to take those courses again because I took them in, like, the last century, but <laughs> it's true. But uh, one of the great points I got from them was the myth of the great argument, um, the idea that, you know, I'm right, I know I'm right, you guys got to know I'm right, you know, I'm just going to keep telling you how right this is because it's so right, surely you will come around to my side. Uh, and that was very, very, very difficult for me to let go of. Um, but, uh, but this... Uh, I'll save you all course tuition, just let go of that one, but the, uh, <laughs> if, if, you, if you can unify people around a higher level vision, um, you know, so the mission of the board is to protect the public and, and improve yeah. the profession. So that's pretty great, you know, it's pretty easy to get people to agree that that's right. Uh, so you can really motivate people and, and make all your decisions going, so does this, does this do that? Does this, does this protect the public? Um, and, and then uh, once you've got everybody sort of in that place, then you can go back and say, also, we can't, we can't go broke, you know, so we have to, you know, do this with the finances or we have to do that with the finances. But I really, it's helpful to me that I really, really believe in what we're doing. So that, that helps gather people. Um, so, you know, protecting the public, enhancing the profession. Wally Ritchie, who was the executive director, uh, also in the last century, sent me a letter saying, uh, you know, it's the best job in the world because uh, you're, always, you're always on the side of the angels. Uh, he said, just, uh, he said, sometimes it's a little hard to tell what side that is, but you'll always figure it out. And so those things are really very helpful to me. And people hear that. People hear it. The people in the office who have to work on those things, the board of directors, the diplomates, the sort of ever widening circles can resonate with those as long as you are reasonable and listen to them in the, in the fact area underneath the high vision. John, could you talk a bit uh, about the number six? Uh, creating short-term wins. Uh, I would just say after hearing the leadership uh, style lecture today, I thought that this green area is where the four different styles of a leader comes in most on this graphic. But uh, speaking on creating a short-term win, how do, how do you do that? Do you declare going into it what will constitute by metrics the win and when you achieve it, you achieve it? Or do you do it in real time or any thoughts? Yeah, well, I think it's important to declare in advance what what good looks like, what exceed looks like. You, know, you want to exceed expectations. When you're trying to initiate change and there's all this inertia, which we see so much in, in medicine, um, you, know, what you, you really are limited to short-term wins, and that's okay, because once you get one, then that can snowball. So we had an example of, we were trying, we, we have a group that, that is uh, going into hospitals and seeing all the inefficiencies in the hospitals, and trying to get the C-suite to buy into um, certain practices that they can undertake that make the hospital so much more efficient in OR flow and in other ways. And we just couldn't get hospitals in the U.S. Outside the country, yes, but in the U.S., we couldn't get hospitals to buy into this until we finally got to one. And they said, okay, we'll allow you, even though you're an industry organization to come in here and look we'll just show you all our books and you tell us where we're being inefficient and and you tell us how we can be better we got that one hospital to do it they were part they had great success the metrics that we put out in advance were all met and exceeded 
Mm. And as a result, they then the whole health system then bought in that that hospital is a member of, and now we can take that win and go elsewhere. Fantastic, please. I'm Valerie Delory. I'm a fellow from Montreal. Um, if you do have, uh, talking about inertia, if you do have uh, people in your team that are not willing to change and they're just basically negative and telling you, no, this won't happen and it will never change and the team is like this and uh, I don't see any, any uh, it won't change. Um, do you tend to exclude them? Do you tend to try to motivate them? Do you tend to try to find their little weakness uh, or, or a positive side where they will probably join at one point your ideas? Such a great question, yeah. That's great. Um, so the, uh, so uh, let me offer you a couple of tactical approaches to that. One, uh, number one, you got to evaluate whether or not you have the right team um, because there seem, would seem to be in the face of good analysis of where you need to move to in the future to be relevant if they're saying no, we're not going to change. Uh, there's an element of group think there, and I, I, I would suggest that the team has not been constituted properly. Um, and if you can't just disband that group and reconstitute the group, then I think what you need to do is add to the group some other people who think totally different. Um, and, um, you know, uh, one of the truisms about uh, radical change and disruptive change is that it never, never occurs with the incumbents, right? It's usually um, outside uh, new entrance into the industry that disrupts the industry. I mean, everyone heard about the Kodak uh, experiment, I mean the mm. Kodak moment, right? Kodak was a leader in uh, obviously uh, film photography, but they also invented the digital camera. But because all of their incentives, uh, all of their organizational structure, all of their thinking was aligned with maintaining their primacy in the film market, they never took advantage of the fact that the digital camera was the way of the future. What happened? They filed for bankruptcy. So the important issue is that you've got to uh, build that uh, diverse team. And when you, the team is not working, if it's stuck, uh, then uh, if you have the luxury of disbanding it and reforming it, that's fine, but otherwise add new people that think totally different to the team to disrupt that group think. Others? Thank you. I would just say that we wouldn't want to, in general, I don't think that it's the right choice to just exclude someone who's disruptive or difficult or sort of outside of the rest of the team. Um, it's much better to use an approach to try and understand where they're coming from, of course, um, and then, um, much like John said, to add in or dilute out that factor. If you just can't bring them back in and they, they're going to stay there, uh, figure out a way to dilute that down. No, another thing is to help them understand that with leadership there's value in adaptability, as we just learned earlier. Aaliyah? Hi, uh, Aaliyah Qureshi, BIDMC. So thank you for this excellent panel discussion. That brings me to the question that I have that you may or may not be able to answer, and that is there is this perception that in the field of surgery, surgeons are very resistant to change. So do you think that's true? And if so, why? Why does that exist? Where are those psychologists? <laughs> Can they come back? Uh, yeah, so, so we're people. Um, and, uh, you know, many groups are resistant to change. Uh, we have a rich history uh, of how we develop ourselves professionally uh, that uh, maintains a certain way of doing business. Um, so, uh, you know, there's some truth in that. Whether or not we're more resistant than other groups, uh, is open to question. I think in some ways we feel more responsible for the outcome. I remember Jerry Austin telling me uh, when I signed on as a surgical resident uh, and I had, uh, now don't, don't boo me, I, I had been an internal medicine resident beforehand. Um, uh, he said, you know, John, the difference is you can never take the scar back. And that says it all. So we feel more responsible and so uh, we hold on to our judgment and uh, perhaps a, a little tighter. But having said that, surgeons have been innovators, mm -hmm. clearly. 
Uh, and so we must capitalize on that. The key is making sure that uh, we are well versed in, uh, again, the, um, the imperatives that are driving change so that we don't hold on, we're not constrained by our history and we can see where we need to go in the future. I don't know if that answers your question. It but does. Yeah. Thank you. Others, are we resistant to change? What do you think? What do you see from the board side? <laughs> um, so, uh, I just, Deb just asked me a, sort of what do I see from the board side, and you know, it's a really big country. That's what I see. <laughs> so it's so big it's practically ungovernable. You know, with different uh, different cultures and different states and different areas, and surgery is a really big field with so many different practices that it's hard for me to speak to that because we're in a room of people who really do embrace change. Sages, it's a society yeah. that historically embraces change. To me, one of the biggest changes that's happened in surgery over time is, uh, you know, for uh, certainly during my training and beyond. The person uh, who did the biggest cases got the biggest job, uh, and the biggest job was the chair of surgery. That was as high as anybody went. That was as high as anybody aspired to. Uh, and now, in the intervening 20 years, you know, the biggest job is you know, it's the president of the hospital, it's the head of the practice plan, it's the CEO of the health system, and surgeons are in those roles, which is really quite a huge change. Um, and with that, the sort of teaching, thinking, leadership uh, mindset, I think, has changed. So. Uh, so I, I think uh, I, I like the comment about the scar not ever going away because I think that that's at the core of, uh, of that resistance. But I think as a culture, we've changed a lot in the last 20 years. Maybe, maybe just to add to that, because I think it's a, a wonderful point that the universe is expanding for us surgeons, but I think we could go a lot larger. If a lot of times when I talk to our, our surgical colleagues, we feel like change is happening to us, right? We're not the we're not originating change. And so how are we going to originate change? Well, we've got to expand beyond our traditional roles. And this audience, of course, has done so. Um, I, when I get emails from you, I see uh, in your email signature that's like 15 lines long with all the titles that you have. And uh, so you are getting involved. But I would suggest that we could get involved even in a broader way. We need programs like this to give us the skills so that we can go out and put docs into uh, into insurance companies, you know, into government, not just you know, in, into the C-suites, um, uh, docs who go into the press, because we need to be part of more of the stakeholders. There's a lot of stakeholders, right, in, in medicine today, and we're just living in the realm of the provider, but we should live in the realm of, of the payer, and we should be influencing the employers who are mostly self-insured, the large employers. We need to influence all the different stakeholders and be part of all that if we really want to have a sea change in healthcare. Jeff. Yeah, uh, Jeff Marks, the case restaurant in Cleveland. This is fantastic. I have a scenario that I need maybe some guidance on. And it's not so much leading change, but the perception is reality in terms of change for people mm -hmm. accepting change. And I'm referring to trainees, let's say, all right? And I, about once every six months, I'm at my hospital as a program director on a Sunday afternoon because faculty have left, there have been institutional changes, a program director has gone on or a new chairman, and residents and fellows don't like change, okay? And change is a part of life, and, and I spend a lot of time going through this, and I'm wondering if, how do you get to step number four without one, two, and three, or how do you guide the perception of change as being a part of life, rather than actually leading the change from the beginning? And I'm open to any suggestions. Uh, so uh, perhaps I, I can start from a, sort of a big picture um, set of issues that um, I've had to deal with repetitively. Um, sometime in my pathway uh, uh, to becoming what I consider a strategic leader, um, uh, I was introduced to a concept uh, called VUCA. Anybody hear that term before? Yeah, it, it stands for, it's an acronym for standing for a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Uh, uh, admittedly comes out of the military, but if you think about those words pushed together, uh, it, it spells kind of chaos, right? Or in some, some ways, it means it's a, a very um, uh, fast-moving, dynamic uh, situation. Well, I would suggest that healthcare uh, and the world we're in, particularly as we move into the digital age, um, and we work in so many dimensions, is constantly changing and VUCA. And what you need to do 
is begin to train residents to understand that that is the world there. That has got to be introduced as, almost as any other uh, pedagogical kind of uh, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, theory or discipline, that they're going to be working in a world that is constantly changing. When I started out as a young vascular surgeon, it's not what vascular surgery is today. Um, and the, ra the, the, the pace of change is just increasing all the time and the dimensions of change. So part of their core competency now is understanding how they're going to constantly work in a changing world. As an organization, you've got to also, I think, provide a way of sustaining uh, uh, standards, quality, uh, teaching uh, through changes as leaders come and go as well. So the organization has got a plan for that kind of change as well. Thank you. So, so that does get me back to uh, one of the things I said in the beginning, which is uh, that, that resistance to change is often about fear and loss. Um, and so I think on your Sunday <coughs> afternoons, when you actually have to go in, that's probably what you have to address is their fear and loss. Um, and then since you know that you're doing it every six weeks, I would well, put, six it, months, put it back, okay, yeah. I was gonna say, I put it back on you and you know, it's, I, I like to read books and I like to give people books, you know, I would give them some books on, um, you know, Living Beautifully with Change by Pima Chodron or, you know, one of the other, uh, just sort of, you know, just make it part of the process. And I agree it's part of, it's one of the competencies. I also want to know if book is a noun or an adjective or is it a verb? All of the above. <laughs> yeah. The second law of physical Thank chemistry. <laughs> I think, though, that you've got to give them that emotional stability, yeah. some sort of bedrock, and oftentimes, perhaps, reflecting on where you've been and like bringing them the give, reviewing the history of where you've been and what's happened prior to this new change, whatever it is, um, can be grounding for people. It is, it, it, but it's the perception is reality issue yep. for them when they're in that situation. Yeah. Great. Thank you. One final question. Uh, good evening to the panel. Uh, Obo Sikhaisi from University of Texas, <coughs> Houston. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jones, for an incredible day. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. Uh, this is a very delicate question, and I'm not sure I should be asking it, but uh, <laughs> I'm very impressed that Medtronic and Ethicon are sitting on the same panel. That is amazing. Um, so I come from a system where we've shifted from Ethicon to Medtronic, and I worked with Ethicon as a resident, fellow faculty, and I was one of the voices who opposed that and got quickly silenced. So, um, and it's fine, I read the data, I bought in equivocal products, uh, you know, I drank the applesauce, but anyway, how do you reconcile um, being almost forced to make a change because there's a kind of, um, you feel, I felt forced, even though the data matched. It's like, okay, there's a kind of, um, what's the word? Um, I want to sound self-righteous, but you know, it, thank you. I try not to say that. You, you feel forced, you feel forced to make the change and, um, you know, on some, on some moral ground, but, um, Change is good, but how do you sell that, that you're not being forced to make that change? Does that make sense? Goodness. Yeah. I'm not sure if I totally understand the question, but um, you know, you, um, if, if you want to make that change, and, and you pointed out that, that, that we're both here, for example, on the same panel, and maybe I can give an example. I'm not on the level to want to make that change. I'm, I'm, a foot so I'm, I'm not on the level to say I want to make that change. As a foot soldier, I'm part of an organization that made a change. So I'm trying not to be too specific here. <laughs> but um, so, so, so maybe I can give uh, an answer that you may not want to hear. But uh, in fact, I think it's something that we all need to consider. Um, and I think it was alluded to by one of the previous speakers that good leadership actually begins with good followership. And it, it, it may sound like an oxymoron, but the issue is that uh, if you are in that uh, leader-follower dynamic, and we all are at some point because we have a higher boss or um, higher headquarters or whatever, 
and uh, there's been a diligent, due diligence that's been applied to an analysis, and a strategy has been adopted that makes um, uh, the program sustainable and puts the organization on, uh, on a pathway to relevance for the future. Even though it may not comport well with us as an individual, we have to, as members of that organization, sometimes um, get in line and do everything possible to make that uh, vision uh, a reality and to make that success uh, possible. Now, I, I'm not, there may be legitimate reasons for not having changed the product. That's not what I'm, I, I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that um, you as a member of an organization, all of us as a member of an organization, uh, in that f uh, leader follower relationship, um, have to uh, look at the decisions that have been made um, and in the analysis if it's, uh, it, it works because of a higher purpose then sometimes we have to fall in line and, and support that. But it, it could help to actually think of it from this, the inquisitive surgeon investigator mindset and saying okay I didn't make this change, I don't choose this, I don't necessarily want this but given that it's true that it's going to happen what, how will it work better for me? What, what about this could potentially be good or better? And sometimes the answer is it's not, and, pe and the change reverses. But I think the challenge for us is to be open-minded and to think about how the change, and, and to explore all the ways the change could be beneficial. I'll leave it to you to uh, <clears throat> look at these last two areas here. Uh, about don't let up and make it stick. You heard some things that are important even to Dr. Nagel's point of uh, thinking back and saying uh, thank you and celebrating success. One last quick question. Sorry, jeez. Oh, um, Wanda Good uh, from Washington State. I was just gonna make a comment to that because that's one of the biggest problems I think that all of us have at the core is that we're still the surgeon and we're the ones that put the incision in the body. And so it's very difficult to constantly be forced to be a business. And I, I know everybody knows this already, but I thought it might weigh in or help or give a perspective. Um, I've endeared myself to my C CEO, CFO. Um, he actually drove an hour and a half to see me speak, uh, do a CME for providers. And I was like, oh my God, I've achieved something that the CFO is that's fired up. But it's because I speak to cost, efficiency, dollars. I speak his language. 100% when I'm with him, and then also I'm passionate about patient outcomes and anything that talks about the patients, you know, they do buy into. But I was going to say anything that is happening to us, we have to take control of and get ahead of, and then it doesn't feel like it's happening to us. It feels like we're creating in that change. And I might just be switching it around to make myself feel better, but it feels better. <laughs> you know, um, you heard earlier that leading change is one of the most difficult requirements of a successful leader. Uh, it's inevitable. It's not going away. Uh, a number of you uh, won't understand this, but here in Boston, we're soon to be faced with this terrible white coating on just about everything there is, from roads to sidewalks. And so it's inevitable. So one way to leave it uh, is to take it in stride and don't take it too seriously. I was going on a college hunt with my oldest daughter and she read the following to me while we were driving through South Carolina and I think it's very telling. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Jones. Well, well Mark, you, Mark, you're absolutely masterful at this session, so thank you very much. Um, we do need to thank uh, Intuitive and Medtronics and Ethicon, as well as our foundation. Des, if you can come up for a second. See Dr. Burkett? Uh, um, also, uh, a little story uh, about how things can, can happen. Uh, if you look on the, the fourth page of our brochure, there's uh, some coins. And in 2012, we introduced those to sages to recognize uh, young leaders and, and f committee members. And that idea came to us from General Woodson. And so thank you, Dr. Woodson, again for the influence you've had on our society. <laughs> yes. Dan, congratulations on an excellent meeting. We've got to remember that the foundation is important to SAGES. SAGES is a fantastic organization that's growing rapidly. 
and has over the years. As I said earlier, the first meeting I went to for Sages, there were 50 people in the audience. But I realized there was something about it. And look how it's grown. Someone earlier said they didn't understand the, the Sages and the Foundation. In 1980, no, 1998, we realized that there needed to be a new way of funding Sages for the future. And that was to form a foundation, which is a 501c3, and that is, means that any donation is tax deductible. If you make a donation to, stage, to Sages itself, it is not tax deductible. The two have to be totally separate as regards um, <coughs> governance, etc. So that those that have been put out to pasture are now in the foundation, leaving Sages to run itself. Now, what happens is we then went to industry and got industry to support us. Most of the major groups gave us huge donations of a million over several years. So we didn't have to come to other people, and so we had the whole idea of getting to, to 10,000, and we got to 10,000. And it was from major donations from industry. Then we decided <clears throat> that we needed to go to 20, because 10 was the dollar had gone down considerably, and it didn't, wasn't quite the same. But in the meantime, we were spinning off 5% of our corpus to the foundation to support it. I mean, to support the sages. And sages would come to us asking for money. This year, they came to us and asked for 650,000. We couldn't come up with that. We could only come up with 520,000. However, we have given to sages from the grants that they have asked us for to for research, leadership, uh, for education, for web-based things, for a lot, including this, this meeting today was funded by, Sage, by the foundation. We have given out $4.3 million so far. <clears throat> now, we're coming into the next phase of going for the next 10,000. What we're finding is that industry does not have the money. The most we have been able to get from industry, instead of the million that we used to be getting, was, five, it was 100,000 over five years, and the majority of industry are giving us 20,000 apiece. Therefore, we're going to have to come to, to you. We've been to the philanthropy groups and said, would they support us? We were doing wonderful things for patients with minimal access and so forth. The question they said was, What's the percentage of your members that support the foundation? When we said 11%, they just said thank you and left the room. So we've instituted a program of trying to get, by the year 2020, 80% of the membership supporting the foundation. There's a program of 80 by 20. Now, we got to remember with donation, you donate to your charities every single year. People somehow feel that the foundation, they've just got to give once and we'll be happy with them. Some of us give every single year. And that's what we have to do is get recurring support. Just tell me, what surgeon cannot afford to give the Sages Foundation $20 a month? on a recurring basis. If they did that, and we got to, to 80 by 20, we would be able to go to the philanthropic groups and say, please support us. So we ask you to not only pony up yourselves, but please talk to your colleagues and try and get the word out that we want to get the Sages Foundation in a strong position to be able to help the fast-growing Sages organization. We would pr much prefer to be able to say, when Dan Jones came to us this year and said he wanted 650,000, 
when we told him we could only do 520. We would like to have been... We, well, we, yes, but... <coughs> we, uh, I don't think... I don't, I don't know about that. You're, you're, you're spinning. No. But the important thing is we can't meet what are the requests. We need to be able to because we've got to grow sages more. So please talk to your friends, colleagues, and so forth, and try and help us in the foundation. We're passionate about supporting sages. We would like you to be passionate about supporting the foundation. Please have a good drink. Now, one last thing. Some of you have asked, how do you get the button? And for any amount of donation, uh, you'll get the button. So when you're at the reception next, you'll be on board with us. So again, thank you for your participation. Part of the reason this was very good was because of all the questions you brought. We had people coming in from Japan and across the country. Uh, it's noted and appreciated. And we welcome all of you to email us about the committees and ways you want to get involved. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, panels. <laughs>